anticipated preaching a message like I am this morning, only I am anxious because it's a subject that's hard to articulate. So Crystal just renamed our fireside. It's not fireside anymore, Barb. It's fire time. So we like that. So I want to talk this morning about experiencing God. I think that most of us have a tendency to sometimes shy away from an experience with God, but we don't have a problem experiencing anything else. We like to experience everything in life, but for some reason, experiencing God seems to be a little bit intimidating or concerning. So I'm going to start this morning with some questions. How do we know that Christianity is not just a philosophy that we follow? When does it become a reality that my relationship with Jesus is real and that I'm not just talking about some historical figure, but I am in an ongoing personal relationship with deity, that I'm not talking to the man upstairs, but that I'm talking to someone who lives within me, that I'm no longer picking up the Bible to find an answer to an argument, but that I am reading it because it is a love letter to me. It's a lifeline that guides me just as important as a GPS is in my car that guides me to a far remote location somewhere across the nation that I've never been to, but I know that it's going to get me to that destination. That's what the Word of God can do for me. So this morning, I want to take you to Psalm 63 because it started me on a totally different trajectory in my ministry and my life. You see, I grew up in the church. My father was a pastor. Everything was church and churchy to me. I did what all good church people do. I said what all good church boys say. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was four. My grandma says I gave my heart to Jesus when I was three months old, but I don't remember that. (laughs) I got baptized when I was six. I went to a Christian university I studied clinical psychology and ended up being a pastor. I did what all good pastors did. And then I moved back to Canton where I said I would never, ever live again. And I had this living experience with the presence of God that changed my life forever. And the only way I can explain it, and it's probably not a good explanation, it was like I went from dating a girl and falling in love and getting married and actually having a wife, and there's no comparison to dating and marriage. Would you agree with that? So it may not be a good illustration, but what began to change my life was reading Psalm 63, and you can follow along with me if you want. Now, I'm going to be emotional this morning, probably, because this is what changed my whole life. Because like I said, I grew up in church. There's a difference between growing up in church and having a relationship with Jesus. And I didn't know that. I just was doing the church thing. But it says this, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my Flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. And because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips are going to praise you. Thus will I bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. 
When I remember you on my bed, I meditate you on, uh, and I meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion to the jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. As I started looking at this psalm over the years, I, I, I started asking myself, uh, do I know what it really is to have a real experience with God? That do I know his loving kindness that's, that's better than life? And so my question this morning to all of us is, what are the marks of an authentic experience with God? Not a religious experience. Not going to church and going through the motions, but how is it that I have a real live experience with God? That he is not just a part of my life on Sunday or when I think about him before I have a meal and I pray. But it's this relationship with God that I'm, I'm driving down the road and I can't help but sing about the goodness of God. And can I say that I think that we have times where God is nearer than other times. And can I even say that I think there are times in history where we have a, a, a greater visitation of God. And, and I can tell you that most of us in this church, a, a lot of us that know each other well, had a real visitation in the 80s where God came in, in the form of, of worship and, and, and we knew him in a great way. And a lot of us, we go back and talk about that. Now, some of you don't want to hear about that because you think, you know, that's just old. And that, that forever changed our DNA spiritually. Now, what I'm saying about that is I, I think we're due for, for that to happen again. And, and so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm not, I'm baiting the hook. I'm, I'm, I'm preparing us for what I believe can only start happening first in us individually. There has to be a hunger in us individually and then it needs to take place in us individually as we come together corporately, then there needs to be what I call a sickum to God. God, here we are. We are, we are waiting on you to touch us in ways that we have never been touched before. So as we look at Psalm 63, I see in Psalm 63, and I'll get to it in a minute, three marks that I believe call us to a spiritual experience. And then I see Two things that I believe are just disciplines, things that we just have to do. And I think it's difficult to talk about spiritual experiences because all of us are different. And most of us see spiritual experiences as subjective. Well, that's just how you were. That's just how you saw it. That's just how you felt about it. Because one person can talk about experience, and it doesn't necessarily mean that to another person. So I'm going to tell you a couple experiences. Years ago, I was reading a, a C.S. Lewis's book, and I think it was his autobiography. I believe it's called Surprised by Joy. And he tells something that happened that just, I mean, this is just kind of, it's kind of crazy. He said, when I was a boy, he was nine years old. Now, you got to know that he was a genius, and so that makes a lot of, a, a, a difference in it. But he was, he was reading a, a mythology book. I think it was called, like, Norse Smiths and Poems or something like that. And he said, one of the lines in the poem that just hit me, he said, it says, I heard a voice that cried, Balder the beautiful is dead, is dead. Balder the beautiful is dead, is dead. That doesn't do anything for me. But C.S. Lewis said, I knew nothing about Balder. I knew nothing about the myth behind him. But he said, instantly, I was lifted up into the regions of the north sky, and I had a desire that was of sickening intensity that cannot be described. And as suddenly as I found myself, almost immediately falling out of that desire, and I wish that same desire was back. And then he goes on to say, and if you find that episode of no interest in, to you, then you need not read my book any farther. Because he says, I believe that that's the central story of everyone as life. That we have to find that thing that just grabs our desire and we say, I can't live without that. 
Now, I don't know about you, but basically, that's the experience with God. That we have this desire to know him with such intensity that nothing else or everything else pales in comparison. Blake basically says everyone's autobiography is about the same thing. He said, I call that, I call, he said, I call what I experience and what I continue to experience in strange and weird places, I call it joy. I call it joy to distinguish it from pleasure. He says, joy is a desire for something which even unfulfilled is more desirable than other satisfactions. Let me go on. He says, what he is saying is, a joy is a desire for something so sweet and so strong that even to long for it unfulfilled is sweeter and more satisfying than to have anything else that is fulfilled. The desire for this unfulfilled, more satisfying than anything else fulfilled, he says, to even be thirsty for this and not get it is more sweet than to drink anything else. That's an amazing statement. He says, joy is never in our power, but pleasure is. He's saying, basically, to try to get an experience with God on your own is impossible. Now, we can have pleasures. And I don't want to talk about that a lot, but I think a lot of times when we talk about the song that got us, the, the thing that spoke to us, those are pleasures. But there's something beyond that that will forever change your DNA spiritually. You'll say, I know when that happened. And he goes on to say, as a little boy, it happened when he was reading some other book. I don't even know what it was. And he often said it happened when he fell in love. It often happened when he found a friend. It often happened when he started a first job. He said it was a new joy. But he would find that, that the object that aroused him would often not be able to sustain it and fulfill it because he would find out that it was, it was too strong. Has that ever happened to you? It's interesting. Rouse something in you that was like, oh my gosh, I just love this. Or, or maybe a friend or, or But I had something similar happen in my early life before I even understood the fullness of the spirit. It was, um, it was, um, um, it was something that marked my life. Um, it changed me. And it was back in the day. When I had Mr. Till as a teacher, you know, Fulton County's renowned, self-acclaimed atheist, he wanted us to read Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the hang Hands of an Angry God, because he wanted to emphasize that God was such a bad God, and if he was really, you know. So we all read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and he especially liked to zero in on me because he knew who I was and that kind of thing. And it didn't work really for me because I became enamored a little bit with Jonathan Edwards. I thought, I really like this guy, Jonathan Edwards, even though some of his stuff was, and it was puritanical, I understand that. But I, I got enamored by some of his writings, and I, I, I read, wrote, read something that he wrote. Jonathan Edwards was 21 years old. He was still uh, in Yale University, and he was, uh, uh, it was I think it was 19, or 1723. And he fell in love with a 14-year-old, 15-year-old girl. That would have been a scandal at that time. But he ended up marrying her. And he, he wrote something to her. It's called uh, Apostrophe to Sarah Pierpoint, his soon-to-be wife. I read this. Now, this may not mean anything to you. It may be about as bad as whatever I said about is dead is dead. But he says, there's a young lady in New Haven who is beloved by the Almighty, being who made and rules the world, and there are certain reasons in which this great being, in some way or other, invisible, comes to her and fills her mind with exceeding sweet delight, and that she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him. She has a strong sweetness in her mind and is singular in her purity and affections, and she is most conscientious in all of her actions. She has a wonderful sweetness and calmness and universal benevolence, especially after those seasons, after this great God has manifested himself to her. 
She expects after a while to be received up to where he is, to be raised up out of the world and to be caught up into heaven because she's assured that he loves her so well that he would never remain at a distance from her. There she will dwell with him and will be ravished by his love and delight forever. She will sometimes go about, I see, from place to place, singing sweetly and seems to always be full of joy and pleasure, and no one knows for what. She loves to be alone and wander in the fields and the mountains and always seem to have someone invisible conversing with her. Now, I don't know whether that does anything for you. It may seem a little weird to you. But when I read that, I did not have that kind of an understanding of a relationship with God. I wasn't necessarily falling in love with Sarah Pierpoint. I was falling in love with the God that she knew because for some reason she was having some kind of a relationship and experience with God that I hadn't had. All I'd ever known was religiousness. I didn't know what it was to go from place to place singing to him and having this sweet desire. And not only that, but to have such character in her life because of a relationship she had with God. That did something to me. If that's not enough, in reading some more of church history, if anybody's read anything from Spurgeon, Spurgeon was a Baptist preacher. Now, I have to warn you that he always talked in the plural. He said this, some of us to be too happy to live, at one point, the love of God was so overwhelmingly experienced to us on one occasion that we almost had to ask God to stop the delight. If he had not veiled his love and glory, we would have died of joy. Now you say, that's interesting. The first time I read Spurgeon, I said, what is that? The first time I read about Sarah Pierpoint, I fell in love, not with her much because she's dead, but I fell in love, and I'm not sure what, but I fell in love with who she was in love with. Are you listening to me? I would suggest that whether you are a Christ follower or not, you need to know something about this experience with him. And what Lewis was talking about was something that he was talking about. He wasn't even a believer at that time. But all this leads to this road. Now listen to me. This is the road it leads to. It leads to Psalm 1611. It says, you shall show me the path of life. In your pleasure is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there's pleasure forevermore. In the presence of God. Now, in the original language, it says, in the face of God, you will find fullness of joy. And knowing what David is talking about when he says, in your sanctuary, I beheld your power and glory, he's saying, my soul is feasting on the riches of who you are. And all I can say this morning, that's what I want. I don't want to talk about God. I don't want to talk about what he's not and what he should be. I want to be lifted up to the northern sky. I, I want to I have a lovesick longing to know him in a greater way. Now, Lewis believed that the way you develop friends is that you would stand before them, and if you looked at a painting, and you looked at them, and you saw that they were looking at the painting with the same awe that you were looking at it, those were your people. So I tried that as an experiment yesterday. Uh, We went and had breakfast at Lois and Bruce's house, and they make the best breakfast. A few months ago, I ran into a little song, and I'm a Southern gospel freak. Anything Bill Gaither does, I'm sorry, I'm old. I like it. I love harmony. And... One of my favorite singers, and before I was married, I dreamed of marrying her. Uh, Her name is Janet Paschal. And she came out and sang a song about friendship that I wish if I'd had Curtis, I would have had him bring it up and show the video. It is riveting to me, and it's got words about having a friend. Even though you you haven't seen them for a while, even though you haven't been with them, You just know them. And then it talks about because they pray for you. 
And then after she sings the first verse, here comes Vestal Goodman to sing the second verse. And then they sing the chorus together. And I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it because it's really a great song. So I thought I would try this experiment. I said, hey, Bruce and Lois, have you heard this song? And they hadn't. And the minute I started singing or playing it, Bruce had tears streaming down his cheeks. I had tears streaming down my cheeks. And Jan and Lois were just looking at each other. And I said, these are my people. Now, you, you say, what do you mean by that? I'm just saying, you know, there's just something about when you have something so much in common. Tim Ashley and I had an experience this last week that I won't forget for a long time. Many years ago, Tim came to my living room and sat down with me and told me an experience he had had with God just in a worship experience at 1 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning at his house. And we sat in our living room as he told me that story about God coming to him in worship, and we cried together. And it has forever made me hit my brother from another mother. And that experience changed his life, changed my life. That's when Tim started coming here and, and helped us with worship. And then the devil got a hold of him, and he moved to Quincy. Actually, that wasn't the devil at all. It was one of the best things that happened, I know, especially for Curtis' sake and his ministry and his music. And uh, then they came back here, and nothing really had been said about that. We sat together last Tuesday, and as he recalled that story, we sat there, and the same thing basically happened again. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a fleeting feeling. I'm talking about an experience with God that forever changes your spiritual DNA. I'll talk about that in a minute. But let me give you three things that I believe are the signs of a real spiritual experience. Number one, you'll have an appetite for God. Verse one says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I'm going to say it again. The first sign of a real spiritual experience is that you're going to have a thirst for a spiritual experience. In other words, you're going to have an appetite for God. Say to somebody, I'm going to have an appetite for God. In other words, listen to this. A sense of his absence is really a sense that his presence is working. And he says, because he is my God, I will seek you. It doesn't say, I seek you, therefore you are my God. It says, because you are my God, I will seek you. One of the ways that you know you are an authentic Christian is that you long for the presence of God and you are unhappy and dissatisfied and upset if he's not working in your life. And your unhappiness shows that he's at work in your life. And I don't know about you, but I, I am not satisfied if I'm not having an experience with God. And I'm not talking about just an emotional experience. I mean, when I read the word, I want his word to say something to me that will forever change me. So the first sign is that you want to have an appetite. Just say, I need to have an appetite for God. Now, the second is going to be interesting the way I say it because you're going to think immediately, oh, he's talking about emotions, but I'm not. The second sign is a new sensation. Verse 2 says, I looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. And then verse 5 says, my soul shall be satisfied as with the riches of food and my mouth shall praise you. So the second sign of authentic spiritual experience is that information must become sensation. Beholding his power and glory, I don't think, was a sign and a wonder of something visible. But I think it was that information that we receive from God has to become a sensation. Okay, if I held up a piece of coconut cream pie, which I would love to hold up right now, and tell you about the coconut cream pie and everything that went in it and how I made it, that pales in comparison to you tasting it. How many of you know the verse that says, if God be for us, who can be against us in Romans 8? Have you ever tasted that verse? 
has that verse ever blazed out at you? Only when it has been put to the test in your life can you say, I've tasted that. When, when, when you are afraid about something and you had to say, I, I am going to believe you, God, that, that nothing can come against me. It's when, even when the circumstances didn't change, but you saw that verse and it came alive in your heart and you could sit down and say, I know things haven't changed, but I believe that he is for me and nothing will come against me. That's when your DNA changed. And that's when you say, I've experienced the goodness of God. That's when information becomes sensation. Too many of us have found information just for information. But I need information to forever change me. It's something I have to say, I can't explain it, but I've experienced it. I know that I know that I know that what he said is true, even though it doesn't look like things have changed right now in my life. Number three, the third sign is, a, is this wonderful word, Praise. Verse 3 says, Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Anything that you really love, you have to praise. That's what completes the joy when you can, when you can say, Oh, I, I just I have to tell you about this. One of the ways that you know that you don't believe something is when you can't talk about it. But when you believe something, you can't keep your mouth shut about it. You have to talk about it. You have to talk about it. You have to share about it. I, you know, I, if you just listen to a great piece of music and, and you really enjoy it and you drag someone over and say, you have to listen to this, and someone says, oh, that's pretty good. But when someone says, oh, my goodness, we got to listen to that again, that's what I'm talking about. You feel that incredible joy. You cannot complete your enjoyment of something unless you praise it. And this runs over into your prayer life. You know your prayer life isn't quite right if your prayer life is a shopping list. Give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. You know, bless my brother, bless my sister, and help my aunt's bunions. It's a shopping list prayer. And guess what? If that's what your prayer life is, the only time you're ever going to pray is when you need to go shopping. Dr. Pickett, I go back to her quite a bit. She said a lot of things to me. And she got that little chin out there and she says, Kevin, I don't know how long it's been since I've asked God for anything. Now, I don't know if she's telling me the truth or not. I don't think she lied, but I understood what she was saying. She was saying, when you are living in a life of relationship, you really don't have to ask. God knows what your needs are. You just continue to love him, and he will do everything he can to get you what you need because he knows what you need. I, I, I'm not a perfect husband. Don't, don't even ask Jan about that. But I love her, and I... I kind of know some of the things that she wants and needs, and it's my joy not to have her ask me, but to surprise her with those things because that's my love for her. So if you're, if you're experiencing God, you will not be able to keep from giving him praise, and praise it says we enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving. Then we enter his courts with praise. And then you're full blown on in relationship with God. So if you're experiencing God, you're going to talk about it. You're going to have to say, God, he's just so good. So now let me just end with these two, what I believe are disciplines, things that you just have to know. One of them is found in verse 3. It says, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. And that word loving kindness is just not even the word that you could even use there. It's a bad word. It's just not, it can't explain it. In fact, the word there is, is a word love, but it's not a word that I've ever seen before. And, and I don't even know how to pronounce it in Hebrew, but it's something like kesev. 
And it kind of says steadfast love, unmovable love, unmerited love. And it comes from the ancient wedding vows that says, and thereto I plight you my troth, or troth. Now, anytime I've ever said that to a young couple, they say, can we leave that out? That, we don't even know what plight and troth is. <laughs> and I understand that. But, but plight means danger. And so what you're saying to your loved one when you're getting married is, Whatever is going to come your way, I'm willing to take that with you. So in your sickness, I'm going to take your sickness with you. I'll be with you through it. I'll be with you through poorness. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? Now, you take that a little bit farther. God is saying to you, because even in marriage, there are things that can separate us, whether it be death or whether it be some kind of thing that we would say as biblical vows or biblical reasons why not to stay married, and we don't talk about that, but, but what I'm saying is, God is saying in this verse, he's saying, I'm telling you, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that will separate me from you. God says, no matter what happens, I pledge to love you, to bless you, no matter what it takes. And it kind of goes back to the ancient, and I don't know all the story about Abraham. Remember that, Abra that story about Abraham when God said to uh, to uh, split the animal in half, and God comes be between them like a melting pot, and, and, and basically God's saying to them, I'm, I'm telling you something right now. I'm willing to be the sacrifice. So God says, no matter what, I pledge to be this to you. Now, I'm just, I'm just saying to you, you want to know about experience with God? God is saying to you, there is nothing that was going to keep me from having experience with you. And I think David says, I see that kind of love. And that's what he's saying in Psalm 63. And it's better than life. I don't know if you're getting this. You can't help but praise when you understand that God is saying, what I'm about to give you is better than you can ever have in life. There's nothing in life better than what I can give to you. I'll quit. The second discipline is this. Verse 8. My soul clings to you. Now, we get that word from the word cleave. And all I'm going to say to you this. This is why I want you to hear this this morning. Because a lot of our experiences are based on feelings and emotions. And so when emotions and feelings quit happening, sometimes we give up on God. I've had people say, well, I was trusting God, but then I didn't get my new car, so... I just don't think God really loves me. Do you realize how petty that is? Mm. And that was a petty example. There's examples that are much deeper than that that people still give up on God. But to make a promise and keep on keeping on is what God is saying. No matter what's going on in your life right now, you need to keep on believing that God is the God who says he is. Pay attention to your experiences. And this is how I'm going to end. Pay attention to those aha moments when God comes in and says, I am this to you. I am this to you. It'll change your DNA. So I've had lots of them. And I want you to have them. I don't want you to have church experiences. I don't want you to have mommy experiences and what happened to daddy. You need to have your own. You need to have moments when God comes and says, this is who I am to you. You can take it to the bank that I will not leave you or forsake you. And what I'm about to say to you, you can understand that I am going to be with you through this no matter what you go through. 1984, driving home from Rushville with Bob Davis in the car, coming back to camp because we were going to have a service. All the rest of the people were at Rushville camp, going down a hill. I see a railroad track, and the Holy Spirit says to me, I'm like that railroad track. You need to worship me in spirit and truth. I'll never forget it as long as I live. He said, I'm like spirit and truth, and I'm running parallel. 
Anytime spirit gets ahead of truth, it becomes emotionalism. Anytime truth gets a hold of spirit, it becomes intellectualism. I don't know if that means anything to you. It changed the whole understanding of pure and truth to me. And then I go back and read the Bible. When, when uh, Jesus talks to the woman at the well, he says, you must worship me in spirit and truth. Therefore, when we worship, and this is the beginning of the worship movement in our church, we knew that there has to be some emotion in worship, but it can't be above, uh, above truth. At the same time, we can't just have truth because then all you're just worshiping is sometimes our head and what we have to have emotion as well. Does that make sense to you? Let me tell you another time. I, I was pulling in from Greenville. We went to a camp conference. I was pulling in. We were at the stop sign at 5th and Lynn. And the Holy Spirit said, you can't be just stirred, but you have to be changed. And I saw a glass of tea with sugar in the bottom of it. He said, you can just stir that for a minute. And you'll still have sugar in the bottom of it, but it has to be a point where you stir it till the sugar becomes a part of the tea. Changed my life forever. A lot of times we can be stirred by something in the Word of God, but never let it really become a part of us to the point where it changes us. So don't reduce your experience to just a feeling or an emotion, but don't dismiss your feelings or emotions either. Liver shivers are always inviting. But they're an invitation for something that should have an anchor, which goes much deeper, that will cause your faith to be unmovable. Last story. When Jan and I first met, we snuck away from the campus of all of that Nazarene University to get an ice cream cone. It was my moment. We were away from the RAs and the RDs and everybody else. And we got back to campus, and it was night, and we lingered in the car. And I parked it in the back of the parking lot for a reason. And I went in for a kiss, and I felt a shiver go up and down my spine, and I knew she was the one when I found out her ice cream cone was dripping down my neck. <laughs> I'm sure glad I didn't let that just be the thing that caused me to say well, that's not the right one. <laughs> we live in a world of a lot of stimuli. And there is a lot of stuff that goes on in our world that can bring on emotions and feelings. And I think sometimes the church has pushed those things away, and I understand why. And what I'm preaching about this morning is not for you to get more feelings, but to you to experience God in a way where you know that it's grounded and rooted from the Word of God. But when that happens... It probably is going to, to touch you emotionally as well. And that's okay. What I'm concerned about is that we are not experiencing God at all. That, that we are just letting the word of God be uh, just something that we add to our, um, our memory or to our knowledge. But that he's changing the trajectory of our life because his word is so alive and real and it changes your destiny. So I, we're going to end with a song, but I'm going to end with the song that changed my life. Uh, not not going to sing it to you, but when I started on this journey, I started singing every day and I almost do every day still. I just want to be where you are dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I want to be where you are, dwelling at your table, feasting at your table. That's what I want every day of my life. Let's stand together. 
How many heard what I said this morning? Does that, did that make sense? Okay. Can I challenge you to start experiencing God every day in your life? Can I also challenge you as a congregation that when we come together to worship, that you don't come in here just individually, but you come in as a corporate body and say, let's pull on the presence of the Lord together. Because he has something he wants to do with us. As we come tonight to pray and worship together at, what'd you call it, Crystal? Yeah, we're going to come where the fire is and let his fire dwell in us. You know what the fire does first, though? It burns out. Then it burns in. So, Father, we're here this morning because uh, our desire is to draw closer to you. Draw us where you are. Draw us to your table. Ray sang about that this morning. You built a table. We want to come to your table. We want to know how to live this life in this day. We can't help but praise you. You have done wonderful things. Your loving kindness is better than life. My lips cannot help but praise you. late, but if there's anybody here this morning that just says, you know what, I want to have that experience with God, and you just want, I, I'm going to call it just a little bit of a jolt, the Holy Spirit just to kind of give you a kickstart. I know Mike and Crystal will be here, anybody else who wants to come and pray with people, I want to just have you come and just say, Lord, I want that, I just want to, I want to, I want to have my spiritual DNA changed, I want to know your presence, I don't want to just know about you, but I want to know you more intimately. Just uh, come and let them just have a prayer with you before we go. Otherwise, we want to welcome anybody back tonight who wants just to come for a time of prayer.